Thank you. Well, everyone, uh, welcome here to that uh, super interesting session. At least I find it super interesting. My name is Gary Machado. I'm executive director at INA. And we're going to cover the, the delicate subject of communicating with the public during a pandemic. I'm sure a topic you are all more or less familiar with, as you might have been either communicating or on the other side as a recipient of the communication. Um, I'm joined today on stage by Yves uh, Stevens, who is at the National Crisis Center of, of Belgium, and he will be presented. There are two other speakers who finally, at uh, the last minute, couldn't make it here, so they have recorded presentation. Please stay, stay here, although they are recorded, because they are very good presentations, uh, as you, you will see. Uh, we'll hear from Chris Cocking, Dr. Chris Cocking, who's at the School of Health Sciences, University of Brighton in the UK, and Sven Brun, Department of Emergency Medical Services, at the Direct of Health in Norway. Um, maybe as, as an introduction, I'm going to share a bit of my personal story with uh, communicating during a, a pandemic. So first, I'm uh, as much, actually, I'm myself, the INA team, I'm a French citizen living in Belgium. So I watch French TV and Belgian TV, for instance. And it was quite shocking for me as a citizen, a French citizen living in Belgium, to see the differences in the communication between the two countries, maybe if can a word about that a bit later on, <laughs> remaining politically correct, of course, but since I'm more free, I can speak freely about that. Uh, on the French side of things, we had a, a first phase where the pandemic didn't exist. It was in Italy. Oh, those Italians, maybe they don't know how to manage a pandemic. It will never come to France. And then suddenly it came, and when it came, France had some very drastic measures. You, cannot, you could not go out further than one kilometer of your house. And at the beginning of the pandemic, mask were, mask, masking was totally useless. So uh, doctors came on stage to say, hey, don't wear masks. They're really useless. I was wondering, you know, I'm not, an, I'm not a health professional, but I was like, in Asia, they use it for many years, and they must, they must be very useful, actually. Anyway, we all know the, the end result of this. And on the other side, I'm, I'm not saying that maybe as a recipient, everything was perfect in Belgium, but I could sense far more empathy. Uh, experts every day had a, a, a point, I think it was at 11.30, uh, at the time also with Benoit Ramaker, a former regular attendee of INA conference, uh, with, I would say, a lot of empathy. Also, the prime minister at the time had a lot of empathy in the words they put. Measures, me the, both the measures put in place and the communication around the measures put in place, I found them far more acceptable. And I think the, the Belgian population went along far better with with the, the measures, respecting the measures with the pandemic due to the fact, without having such hard measures uh, as they were in France. Uh, on the other side, I'm, I have another hat, so I'm the executive director of INA. I'm also the co-founder co of the EU Disinfo Lab, an organization that works on tackling this information. And I think we cannot speak about communicating with the public during a pandemic without considering the aspect of disinformation and how it plays right now, on, for instance, on the vaccination topic. And one thing that uh, I, was, I was pretty angry as a citizen, when the French uh, president, I think it was down November, December, said, we will not make the vaccination mandatory. Don't worry, everyone. It will not be mandatory. Uh, and as a result, uh, I could see that this communication was not built based on the public health principle, but based on following a minority on social media who would not get to be vaccinated. And I, I knew this would be an extremely damaging communication. Uh, I think many of us probably did. <laughs> because at the end, vaccination in France is not mandatory, but close to mandatory. Because basically, you cannot go anywhere <laughs> soon if you're not vaccinated. So, so these are elements. I, as, a, as, a, as a random citizen, I wanted to reflect. How do we take into account this information? How do we take into account public health? how maybe we should not communicate only based on Twitter, because we have another objective, vaccinating people, public health, and, and all these elements. So that was a long intro from my side, from really a topic I find absolutely fascinating. And uh, well, I'll stop talking. I'm talking too much. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll ask for the presentation of uh, Dr. Chris Cocking to be, to be launched.
Okay, Sveiks to all our friends in Latvia, and apologies I cannot be with you today. Uh, this is my talk on emergency pandemic behaviour and public communication, um, and my contact details are on this front um, page. I understand the slides will also be made available afterwards um, if you're interested in contacting me as well. These are my contact details on the front. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is a brief introduction into psychological theories of crowd behaviour. Um, and implications for emergency planning and response. Um, and then I will look at how this relates to the current COVID pandemic. <clears throat> so the study of emergency behavior started off with the um, panic model, um, which until relatively recently uh, was quite influential in emergency planning and response. Thankfully that's changed because uh, myself and colleagues who work in this area have spent most of our career trying to debunk the panic model um, because it's just not supported by evidence of how people actually behave in emergencies. Um, it comes very much from an irrationist tradition of crowd behaviour, the idea that people cannot be trusted to behave sensibly in crowds because they just encourage irrational behaviour such as panic, hysteria, uh, stampede, trampling, etc, things like that. Um, so one of the main tenets of the panic model is that when you are faced with a threat, when you're faced with adversity, this causes you to become emotional and this emotion then overwhelms your reason and you're no longer able to make sensible, rational choices. Um, following on from that then, your collective identity would break down and it means that you would engage in selfish behaviours such as pushing and trampling. Um, and then finally is the concept of contagion. Um, the idea that behaviours would spread uncritically in the crowd as a whole. So if someone starts behaving in a selfish, irrational way, um, that behaviour spreads throughout the crowd. And it's a, a very deeply held view, even though there's almost no evidence to support that that actually happens. Um, so that's the panic model. Um, and as I said, we are very, very critical of this model. Um, this isn't just an academic exercise though. There are severe implications if uh, you adopt a panic model um, in your planning for emergencies. So the main problem is, is that if you assume that crowds will panic in emergencies, you therefore will guide your emergency planning and response procedures in the frame that they are a potential public order problem rather than a public safety problem. Um, and this can then influence your strategy. Um, an example of this is that um, uh, President Trump uh, last year claimed that when in interviews with the veteran uh, journalist Bob Woodward, that when the COVID pandemic first hit the United States, he initially downplayed the threat to, to avoid public panic. Now, whether or not that's true, um, say for the sake of argument, it is true. Um, I would say that's based upon deeply flawed views of crowd behaviour and uh, public behaviour emergencies. That there's no evidence people would have panicked. And if you withhold information, people are then not able to take necessary action to keep themselves and their families safe and to prevent COVID transmission. And a final implication of the panic model is that if you see um, crowd behaviour, emerge, public behaviour emergencies as um, a, a, in a panic model frame, it means that you see the public as a problem rather than a potential resource um, from which to um, draw upon. Uh, to help guide your emergency response. So there are quite serious implications to having a panic model. So as a result of that, myself and other colleagues have developed what's known as the social identity model of collective psychosocial resilience. Um, and um, in contradiction to the panic model, it argues that rather than fracturing collective identity, it can actually bring people together. It can create an emergent common identity because people develop a sense that we're all in this together. We need to cooperate to ensure group survival. So that then means that people are more likely to behave in orderly and altruistic ways as they confront what they perceive to be this common threat. Um, this means that cooperative behaviour rather than selfish behaviour is the norm. Um, I'm not making claims that there's no selfish behaviour at all, but selfish behaviour is usually a lot less common than is often expected. And it's usually guided by um, people being um, in a physical or structural situation where it's more difficult for them to behave cooperatively or if they are psychologically cast in competition with other people and I'll give some examples of that in a minute. Um, and this model is supported by research uh, that myself and colleagues have done into emergencies. 
Okay, so there are also some politics involved uh, with the notion of collective resilience. I'm very much a fan of the idea that um, crowds and the general public behave a lot more resiliently in emergencies than is often expected. Um, but the term resilience can often be used in a very rhetorical way. It's very common when emergencies happen uh, for politicians to turn up um, at these things and say, oh, the public are behaving very resiliently, etc., and things like that. Um, and often I think they do misuse the term. Um, I would believe very strongly that resilience should not be used as an excuse for not taking public protection seriously or worse even cutting post-disaster support and that's because resilience doesn't mean that people don't have distress or disruption in their lives resilience is more about people's ability to bounce back or sometimes even to bounce forwards if they are enabled to do so if they have the information the training and the resources to do so if those resources are not provided then it's more difficult for them to behave resiliently. Um, it's also absolutely vital for people to, to maintain this shared collective sense of exposure to adversity um, and if you don't get that, if you don't have that shared experience, um, the term we're all in it together can often become empty rhetoric um, and I'll give an example of that shortly. Okay, so moving on to the COVID pandemic, this is an area um, where I think social psychology um, and collective resilience has a lot to say about public behaviour during the pandemic. Um, when the pandemic first hit um, the UK and globally around early 2020, um, the collective responses to COVID were often pathologised, and I'll give an example of this shortly. Um, but I would say that solidarity and cooperation um, are far more common and so we should then use this as a solution to the current pandemic and collective psychology rather than a more individualistic psychology should guide government's COVID policy. Um, what we need to do is we need to encourage a shared identity and we need to trust the public's ability to self-regulate through um, new social norms. Uh, these new social norms could be the need for mask wearing, uh, social distancing, um, etc., um, hand washing and things like that. Things, new social norms to prevent transmission and infection. Um, and um, encouraging collective compliance with these norms will always be more effective than enforcement. Even if there were enough police um, and uh, state enforcement agencies to enforce it, and there almost never will be, um, it's far more effective to encourage collective compliance to get people to do these things because they believe it's the right thing to do, um, rather than them thinking that if they don't do it, they will be sanctioned or punished. Um, it may well be necessary for um, us to have some kind of degree of uh, social or physical distancing um, within the medium to long term, but it's also vital to maintain a sense of psychological connection um, and to try and prevent social isolation. So, for example, during the first uh, UK lockdown, uh, people moved very much to communicating with family members and to work colleagues and friends via Zoom and Teams as a way of staying connected if they weren't physically able to be in contact with each other. It's also absolutely vital to have effective public messaging. Um, because if the public trust the information they're given and they identify the sources that give that information, then they're much more likely to comply with necessary restrictions. Um, and finally, I would also say that we need to encourage what's called more we speak. Uh, we need to present messages that don't just focus on individual survival, um, but focus more on how do we collectively all get through this um, as a way of encouraging collective cooperation. <coughs> So an example of potentially problematic behaviour is the concept that has been uh, termed as panic buying. Um, at the moment, uh, the UK media are talking a lot about um, people panic buying petrol outside uh, petrol stations because there's currently a shortage because of a lack of HGV drivers post Brexit. Um, I would say even the term itself is problematic and I keep saying to the media not to use the term panic buying because it can very quickly become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, this phenomenon was also known just before the first UK lockdown in February and March 2020, um, when people began stockpiling foods um, and supermarket shelves emptied quite quickly. Um, this, I would say, is rather than it being irrational, when if you just call it a 
rational, it just obscures understanding of it and it prevents our ability to understand if you say, well, people in emergencies panic, there's nothing we can do about it because people will behave irrationally. That means that you can't actually address why people do it um, and how to actually discourage it. Um, I would say a better way to describe it is a social dilemma. That what is rational behaviour for the individual, which is to make sure they have enough food for themselves and their families, is not always in the collective interest because, uh, for example, in the UK, we have a just-in-time economy uh, where there isn't enough supply in the system for everybody to uh, stockpile and have their larders and freezers and fridges absolutely jam-packed full of food. There isn't enough supply in the system to do that. Um, but if you label this as irrational, as I said, it just obscures understanding. So what we need to do is rather than reporting panic buying, we need to report um, the equally true message, which is that if you just buy enough for what you need, there will be enough supply in the system. Um, and also, if you do get stockpiling behaviour, having trusted figures such as nurses and not politicians discouraging stockpiling can be very effective. So I've got a link to a video that went viral in the UK of an A&E nurse who was in tears pleading with people to not stockpile because she'd just come from a 13-hour shift to do her shopping and then there was no food on the supermarket shelves and that was considered very effective in discouraging people from doing further stockpiling behaviour. <coughs> okay so I'm going to look now at the brief chain of events of what happened in the UK uh, with regards to lockdown and easing of restrictions. Um, in the lead up to the first lockdown in March 2020, uh, myself and other psychologists were arguing that it is absolutely vital to be consistent in your messaging. And the original message when the lockdown was first um, introduced was actually quite effective. Um, uh, the message was stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives. It was fairly clear, um, fairly clear instruction. Um, and it was delivered by Mark Strong, a UK actor who has quite a severe um, voice. He often plays the villain in movies. He's quite a well-recognised actor and his voice is quite recognisable. Um, and so it seemed to be that people trusted that message. And as a result, compliance rates during the first lockdown were much higher than was expected by the authorities. Um, before the first lockdown, there was uh, fears of a term called behavioural fatigue, um, which myself and other psychologists all rejected because none of us had ever heard of the term before, um, to say that um, they needed to delay lockdown because people would not would only put up with the restrictions for so long. Uh, we were saying at the time, no, don't delay the restrictions, bring them in as soon as possible because people can uh, comply with this if you, if you explain the reason for why they need to do it. Um, and that seems to have been supported by the fact that compliance with the first lockdown, the rates were far higher than were expected by the UK authorities. Um, the compliance rates were between the mid and high 90 percentage of people who did actually comply with uh, the lockdown restrictions. Okay, so things moved on then as the restrictions were eased in uh, May of 2020, um, after the 10th of May, and the message became less clear. Um, it changed to stay alert, control the virus, save lives. And myself and other people were very critical of that message because we were saying it's a lot less clear. Um, it's very unclear what does stay alert mean. Stay, al stay at home is a very clear instruction, whereas stay alert is a state of mind. Um, and it's um, very difficult to kind of understand, well, what actually do people need to do when they're staying alert? Um, what was also a problem was that there were different messages brought out by different uh, nations within the UK. So the English government and the UK government uh, used this new message, whereas the Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish government stuck with the previous message because they weren't ready yet to move to this uh, to the easing of restrictions. And that caused confusion because there were different mixed messages coming out from politicians. There was also a problem with the Dominic Cummings scandal um, when he drove to the north of England while infectious with COVID with his wife and child. Um, and that did seem to affect compliance. Um, and I would argue that's because people may well have thought, well, it's one rule for those in authority, another rule for us. Why should we comply if those in government are not doing it? Um, and so that can threaten public compliance um, if people don't think that they're all in it together. 
Okay, now I think it's absolutely vital as well that you don't blame the public and unfortunately we've had a lot of this with the UK government as when things haven't gone wrong uh, they blame the public. They've said that the public is kind of the weakest link um, and I would say that that's not true. That public behaviour in emergencies in the current pandemic has been far better than was expected by politicians. A quick example of this is that in the UK we've had lots of media coverage demonising young people when they don't follow restrictions such as when they have parties, illegal parties parties in warehouses and outdoors and things like that um, and the problem is is that media often skew the story because it's a lot more newsworthy to show a couple of hundred people partying at an illegal rave um, than it is to show tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of young people staying at home and obeying the lockdown restrictions. Uh, this risks creating psychological outgroups, it risks demonising those young people that are doing it, but it also risks creating a self-fulfilling prophecy because young people who will be complying with the restrictions, if they see footage of illegal parties, they might think, well, why should I comply with the restrictions um, if other people are going out and having fun, why shouldn't I? Okay, so another issue that's um, recently been quite a big issue in the UK um, is the issue of vaccination. Um, we initially thought that um, the, the work for us to do was uh, would, would, would ease up, would end when vaccination, when a vaccine was produced. Uh, we realised that that was wrong because the vaccine on itself um, doesn't work on its own because you need to persuade people to take the vaccine as well. Um, and you also need, even when vaccine uptake is very high, you still do need some precautions because because vaccine protection will never be 100% and if you ease restrictions too early some countries have ended up back in lockdown even after successful vaccination programs such as for example Chile. Um, you also need to engage with vaccine hesitant communities. There are some people in some communities who may have concerns about taking the vaccine and if you demonise them as anti-vaxxers or covid -iots, you're not going to engage with them, you're just going to push them further away. Um, and so it's vital that you address concerns that these communities may have. And a very good example of how that's been tried in the UK is that there has been some hesitancy in the British Asian community about taking up the vaccine. Their up um, vaccine uptake rates in that community can be higher um, than in other communities. Um, so the BBC got British Asian celebrities to do videos addressing all different vaccine myths um, to show to the members of those communities to say it's okay to take the vaccine and that that message is far more effective if it comes from people that they will identify with rather than say for example politicians. A final issue is the um, potential thorny thing of vaccine passports. Um, while there are some common sense reasons for saying that if you want to access services and nightclubs and go on planes and things having a vaccine passport there, there is some sense to that. There are also concerns that it could create a tier two tier society because it could create anger in people that are hesitant and so that could then alienate the very communities that we need to work with. And what seems to happen when you introduce vaccine passports is you get initial rush of the people that were motivated to do it but just hadn't got round to doing it. The vaccine passport can give them the motivation to do it but the people who are hesitant about it having vaccine passports it can actually make them more entrenched and more resistant to taking the vaccine. OK, so um, the final couple of slides, I'm going to look at examples of bad leadership and good leadership, because um, something myself and um, other colleagues uh, continually argue about when we're um, interviewed by the media, for example, is to say that politicians need to show good leadership in emergencies in the current pandemic to encourage people to comply with necessary restrictions. And I would say that the UK government, unfortunately, is example is an example of bad leadership. Um, Boris Johnson's press conferences and his national TV addresses have often taken quite a coercive, instructive line and focusing on people breaching the guidelines, focusing on rule breakers. I would say we need a more facilitative approach. Um, and some of his interviews, um, I've um, some of his press conferences, sorry, um, I've suggested in media interviews come across like a headmaster talking to naughty school children. This has been contrasted with um, the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, who encourages a much more facilitated partnership um, and that's been argued to be more effective.
Now, an example of good leadership is uh, Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand. She's been widely praised for good leadership during the pandemic. She adopts a much less coercive and a much more facilitative, inclusive approach um, to the pandemic and also in her press conferences and the way that she talks and engages with people. And um, following on from that, New Zealand has one of the world's lowest COVID infection rates. So the latest figures for New Zealand, there's just over 4,000 cases and less than 30 deaths, which compared to the UK, is, is astonishingly good. Um, so there are real tangible effects um, to politicians showing good leadership compared to bad leadership. Okay, so I'll finish now with some take home messages. Irrationalist models of crowd behaviour are outdated and unsupported by current evidence. So panic models should not be used in emergency response and the COVID, current COVID pandemic. I would say that collective resilience is a much more likely response during these things. And we should look at ways of how can we encourage more collective resilience in the public. We need to trust the public more uh, to, to behave better in the current pandemic. If we provide them with clear, consistent messages about COVID and the necessary restrictions from trusted sources, along with a reason for why it's important that people do it, you are more likely to see compliance with these necessary behaviours. Um, if you do get competitive individualised behaviour, it's best addressed by effective public campaigns appealing to people's shared identity rather than just writing people off as selfish and irrational. And we also do need less sensationalist media reporting. And I keep saying this to the media um, that they need to stop uh, reporting, for example, panic buying and irrational behaviour and rule breaking um, because it skews the story. OK, so I will finish now because my time's pretty much up just to guide you to some useful resources um, that explain in a bit more detail what I've been talking about today. And then some final references at the end. Um, so thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the conference. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris is not with <coughs> us, so we can't ask him questions. However, would you like to comment on anything Chris said? Anyone? I'm not sure I see. Any hands raised? So on my side, I could challenge, I'm sure, Eve, a few, a few points as well of <laughs> Chris' presentation. But now I'll, I'll give the floor to, to Eve. Thank you. Um, Okay, um, good morning. Uh, my name is Yves Stevens. I'm the spokesperson of the National Crisis Center in, uh, of Belgium. And the National Crisis Center is responsible to manage uh, major emergency, major crises, like for example, uh, the COVID crisis. So I will discuss with you uh, in the next few minutes uh, the crisis communication, how we um, manage the crisis communication during this uh, pandemic. So, first of all, yeah, it's an unseen crisis, I think, uh, uh, for everyone. Uh, because, first of all, the duration. Uh, in fact, it's still going on. But another is, uh, aspect uh, is the impact. This crisis has an impact on every aspect our, of our daily life social life, professional life, family life, um, for children, but also for teenagers, for, for uh, adults. So all the aspects of our social life are impacted. So this, is, uh, this crisis is a huge challenge for the crisis management team, for the crisis uh, management uh, authorities. Uh, and also, of course, for the crisis communication team. Uh, and in Belgium, together with all the involved uh, organization, our main objective from the beginning was very clear. We want to be, in this crisis, the guide for the population. This is an uncertain period for all the population, for all the citizens. We want to be the guide during this unseen and uncertain period. So therefore, objective and correct information was absolutely crucial. Another important point is that this information uh, must be easy access accessible for all the citizens. For example, if you use social media, yet you don't reach 
all the population because there are still a lot of people who are not familiar with Twitter, with Facebook and, and even uh, Internet. Uh, you have to take into account also uh, deaf people. You have to take into account people who are not familiar with French and Dutch. So to b we want to be the guide with correct, easy uh, and easy accessible uh, information. If you want to achieve that main goal, it's important and crucial that you can fall back on a methodology, uh, a process that makes it able to collaborate with, with all the involved organizations, with all the involved partners in this crisis. So, and we have a, a, a methodology uh, called the work process. I don't gonna explain whole this process, but the most important thing is that we take into account not only the reality, and in this case the reality is very, it's for example, the numbers of patients in the hospitals, that's the reality. But in our opinion, if you want to connect with your communication to the population, it's also important and crucial to take into account also the perception of the population, the concerns of the populations, the questions among uh, the population. Only if you take into account reality and perception, you will be able to connect with your target audience. So the first step in this work process is to listen. Listen to the citizens. What are your questions? What are your concerns? And of course, this sentiment, this perception changed a lot during this crisis. And we will uh, discuss this later in the crisis. So we start over here. We're going to listen to the citizens. How are we going to do that? For example, monitoring on the social media. But also, we uh, have also a hotline, crisis hotline the top 10 of the most posed questions is also important information for us uh, because we want to give answers to the questions of the population. So based on the perception and based on the reality, we give an advice, a communication advice. And the first step in a communication advice is what do we want to achieve? What is our objective? If you, if you say my communication advice is to post something on social media, that's not an advice, that's an action. First of all, based on perception and based on the reality, what's the main objective of our communication for this week, for today? Once you have your strategy, once you have your objective, you can work it out in different kinds of communication actions. For example, a press conference. For example, uh, a webinar with teenagers. It, but it all depends on your advice. And your advice is based on reality and uh, perception. OK, let's have a look, first of all, to the reality. Um, this blue line is the number of uh, patients in hospitals. These are the numbers of contamination, uh, 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 people with COVID. So like in the most countries, we had to deal with several uh, waves in Belgium. First wave in March, just like in think, think, think the most uh, countries in Europe. Second wave uh, at the end of 2020, and I hope the last wave in March 21. This is the reality numbers uh, uh, in hospitals, ICUs, uh, people with COVID, positive, uh, posit, uh, posit, uh, positive COVID test. That's the reality. OK, now let's have a look to the uh, perception. This is what we do every day. We make an overview of the perception based on social media. Is this 100% correct? No. But it's an overview. 
this is the perception among the population. I'm not going to explain all the process, but the most important thing is uh, we do it information, behavior, sense making. Sense making are the emotions. Maybe that's m maybe the most important uh, aspect. What are the emotions, the concerns uh, among the population? Um, and here you have the advice. So that we do every day. And based on the reality, based on this, we can uh, rework out a communication uh, strategy. Okay, let's have a look. First of all, I'm gonna skip to over here. This, March, 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 March 2020, March uh, 21. There was the reality, now to the perception. This is March 2020. A lot of solidarity among the population. A feeling of, together we will overcome this situation. We are stronger than the virus. Together we will do this. It was a little bit of feeling. A lot of solidarity. Second one, sec second uh, picture, uh, one year later. During the, the third wave, the situation in the hospitals was the same, dramatic. Here was a lot of solidarity. Here was more like rebellion. People were, uh, there were a lot of demonstrations. People uh, didn't respect the restrictions. Not all the people, but there are a lot of people who had, uh, um, or organiz uh, organi um, who organized some parties, demonstrations, etc., etc. So, although the situation in hospitals was similar, the reaction and the perception was totally different among the population. So, if you, you, we want to connect with those people, we have to adapt our communication strategy and our communication actions. If we do the same thing, the same communication actions in, 2020, in March 2020 than in 2021, uh, uh, we will never connect. So, uh, like I'll, uh, I already mentioned a few times, taking into account perception and reality. Okay, let's have a look to the different situations during the COVID uh, pandemic. This was January 2020. What do we have? Reality, a low risk. Why? At that time, there were a lot of concern, concerns in China, but in Europe, in January 2020, there were a lot of questions, but there were no patients in hospitals, no uh, COVID positive uh, people. So that moment, the reality was low risk. The same time, the perception among a lot of people was the perception of high risk, a lot of concerns, and a lot of questions. Uh, can I still travel to China? Will the virus come to Europe? Etc. Etc. So a lot of concerns, a lot of questions. Okay, if we make oh, sorry, March 2020, the situation totally changed in Europe. High risk, that's the reality. Uh, we all still remember the, 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 the videos from Italy and, and later on of all over Europe, the dramatic situations in hospitals. Reality, very high risk. Perception, also very high risk. In fact, for communication, this is the most easy one. Okay. Next, we make a jump. Uh, March uh, 21, do we have the situation in the hospitals is still dramatic, a high risk, that's the reality. What do we see among uh, a part, oh, sorry, a part of the population, perception, low perception of the risk. Next, 
January uh, 21. It's not really very correct, but we make a jump. That's the uh, start of the vaccine campaign. But to see over here, the reality, low risk. The vaccines are okay, there is no risk for complications or a few complications, but it's okay. But there are still a lot of people who don't trust the vaccines. So high risk, uh, uh, low uh, risk, high perception. Okay, we have now the perceptions and reality. Now the main um, tasks, task of the communication team is to work out a communication strategy, to work out uh, um, an objective that take into account both perceptions and reality. Okay, um, what's the main objective if your uh, reality is low and your perception is uh, high? You go in dialogue with your target audience. You're gonna listen to your target audience. Uh, and I will show you later some uh, examples how you can go in dialogue. The second one is the most easy one. High risk, high perception. You just give instructions. It's for example the same uh, situation if there is a fire in a chemical plant and you see some black smoke coming out of uh, the chemical plant. Everyone is aware that there is a risk and yes there is a risk. So I'm gonna uh, send an uh, alert to everyone in the region, close your windows and close your uh, doors. It's just the same uh, like yesterday. Uh, do you still remember the opening ceremony and the speech of the president of INA? He started with very clear instructions to avoid the risk. Wear your mask. Uh, don't shake hands. Clear instructions. The president it was not necessary to convince or to go in dialogue with you because the president uh, thinks, and I think also, that everyone is aware of the, that there is still a risk. So, instruct. Okay, if there is a high risk, that's a reality, and there's a low perception, your main objective if is convince the people of the situation and motivate the people to respect the restrictions. Okay, I will show uh, some uh, examples. And uh, the last one that was not over here, but for example, if there is a low risk and is a, uh, a low perception of the uh, risk, you just, just have to inform the citizens. For example, uh, communication regarding to earthquakes in Belgium, the risk is very low, perception is very low. You just inform on our website, you can find some information about earthquakes. But Okay, some instructions, very accessible, easy, um, easy, easy accessible uh, information. For example, how to wear a mask. Very clear instructions. Um, with visuals, because it's also uh, very clear for people who can't uh, read, who are not uh, familiar with uh, English, Dutch or French, okay? That's the first situation. The second situation, um, high reality, high risk, low perception. We have to convince the people of the situation. So we will adapt our communication actions. We don't gonna convince them with some visuals. We will convince them by um, explain the situation. Explain the situation by a scientific uh, person. He is a doctor. He was one of the official spokespersons during the COVID crisis. And we gave uh, every day a press conference. And we explained the situation. As you can see over here, very um, easy, plain language to convince the people, to discuss, to, uh, to uh, explain the situation. Convince. Another important thing is to motivate people, to motivate to, um, to respect the restrictions. A positive 
um, campaign. And therefore, we worked out a campaign with different communication actions where we worked on the solidarity. Why I respect the restrictions? Because I want um, to open my pub, because I want to see uh, all my children, etc., etc. A positive campaign to motivate uh, the citizens. Um, also important that you um, take into account all your target audience. If you want to uh, reach uh, uh, teenagers with a campaign in newspapers, you don't reach a teenager. You reach teenagers uh, by using uh, of, uh, um, social media influencers. They don't follow the account of the, so of the crisis center, teenagers, uh, except my son. Um, but they are following those kind of accounts. Uh, I think that's a famous blogger or something like that. I, I don't know the, 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 those uh, guys. But they are influencers. So um, we, uh, uh, we had a collaboration with different kinds of uh, influencers, uh, and it works uh, very uh, well. Um, the last one, dialogue. You still remember the four uh, situations. So low risk, high perception, important to listen to the, uh, to the population, to go in dialogue with the population. And therefore, you can use uh, different uh, communication channels. For example, a crisis hotline. Uh, I explained uh, this morning already the crisis hotline. It's to give information, practical uh, information, but also to listen to, to, uh, to the concerns and the questions of uh, the citizens. Uh, another uh, communication channel that can be used is, for, for example, uh, a webinar. This is a webinar organized for teenagers uh, regarding to the vaccine. Go in dialogue. What are your con uh, questions? What are your concerns? Uh, another uh, communication channel, uh, of course, is social media. Go and interact on the social media. If they have concerns, if they have questions, go in dialogue. Um, that are the different communication channels that you can be used for uh, going dialogue. Just a few conclusions. Um, if you want to communicate during a crisis appropriate, it's absolutely necessary that you can fall back on a well-known methodology. A methodology gives you a structure, but makes it also possible to collaborate with different organizations, if everyone is well aware of this uh, methodology. Uh, take into account percep perception and reality. Um, that was all my uh, main statement. And the last one is also uh, important. Communication, crisis communication is more than sending a message on Twitter or on Facebook. That's your action. First of all, the, the main question is, what do I want to achieve with why my communication action? And is this communication action the most appropriate to achieve my objective? This is your first, first question is, what's my objective? And your last one is, that's my message. Is it, if, uh, uh, if someone start, uh, if your prime minister or your uh, mayor uh, decides to organize a press conference, the first question is, what is your objective for this press conference? So, that's it. My time is up. Excellent, Yves. Thank you so much. It was very good. <laughs> so interesting. Also, a word about the last sentence. Uh, it applies to all types of communications, even outside of crisis communications, yeah. by the way. If you don't know your objective, it's hard to define a message. Um, questions, anyone, to Yves? Yes, there's qu a question there. From Jerome, I believe, no? Yeah. Maybe I see badly. <laughs> ah. Hello, I'm Heiko from Estonia, and uh, thanks for the inspiring uh, speech, and, uh, and I really liked the presentation before that. Uh, Actually, I'm really sad that we could, couldn't share um, our experience uh, with you, but um, I'm briefly going to say that uh, in, during the pandemic, um, we opened one non-emergency number, 124-7. Uh, so one number, 24-7, for people that um, could 
relate and uh, talk to government and the governmental issues. So, um, and we actually use this uh, analytical part. So we analyze the communications of our government and uh, our calls will mainly the um, uh, input for the strategical uh, communication. So um, yeah, we are doing it, still doing it, trying to make it more effective. And we used 180 volunteers actually to respond to calls. So it was huge thing for us and thanks that you shared the mindset. Okay. We can discuss later during Thank the coffee you. break. But uh, in fact, if you, can, if you use the information and the data from your ho crisis hotline, can be very useful in all your uh, crisis communication, uh, in different communication actions. And in a perfect world, if the question that is the most uh, posed during the, 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 in the hotline, and you work on it, Normally, it will go down, and everyone can find the information on the website or on social media. Very good, very interesting. And also, it keeps out of social media to get only the, the sentiment from social media, <laughs> which might differ from a big part of real life. Um, any other question? Maybe someone else had a question behind? No? I don't see any questions, so, uh, so without further ado, we'll launch the next presentation by Sven. Hello everyone, I'm Sven Brun. I'm working with the Norwegian Directorate of Health, and I'm going to talk to you about communicating with the public during a pandemic and uh, uh, using public warning messages to inform travelers and uh, other tools that we use. As you all have probably noticed, we have had a pandemic in the last year and a half, uh, and the pandemic has had major consequences for Norway, just like other countries. But as the figures show, the country has handled the pandemic quite well. Although the number of infected people has been higher than before, the country has succeeded in keeping the number of hospitalizations at a low level. Um, on the upper left side, you can see the number of new infected people per day. Uh, then on the right side, you have the number of deaths per day in Norway that has been quite low compared to uh, other countries that you see on the bottom right. And then uh, the most important figures that we are looking at at the moment is the number of hospitalized patients, and especially those uh, that receive the invasive resp respiratory treatment. And that's quite low. Yeah, in week nine last year, the first COVID-19 case was registered in Norway and the need for information about the virus increased sharply. And we had a congestion of information channels at the Norwegian uh, authorities. And on the 12th of March, the country went into lockdown. In the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, the entire leadership of the Norwegian Directorate of Health was quarantined. And as a result of that, uh, a medical doctor and lawyer uh, with the name of Espen Rostrup Noxta was brought in as an acting assistant director on 14th March. And he has since been like a one man communication agency, appearing almost daily in newspapers and on TV, including live debates and evening news. And along with the Minister of Health, he has been the most prominent face of the pandemic response here in Norway. He has received several awards for his availability, openness and ability to formulate clear and straightforward answers to the public. And his visibility and popularity made him a major success factor in communicating with the public here in Norway. We have used several tools to communicate with the public during the pandemic. We have had press conferences every week on television, <coughs> in newspapers, as on social media. We uh, created an information hotline 
uh, this was operational during the day and has handled about 400,000 calls. We have a chat boot that has been running uh, the whole time and has handled just over 1.2 million calls. Uh, we have a question and answer center in cooperation with uh, the biggest newspaper here in Norway, staffed with our people answering questions from the population. And we have used social media to uh, distribute uh, information. And the picture here is from one of the press conferences from the, with the Prime Minister and the Minister of Health. We have used Facebook. Uh, they have a crisis module uh, where they display a common message for everyone in a geographical area in a given time period. And like uh, Google One Box, we got access to control the content of the Norwegian message and decided where the people should be referred to. And that was, of course, our website with information. Uh, the same uh, happened with Spotify. And of course, we have Google. Uh, they offered us to use their one box, as you can see here on the right side, uh, that appears on the top of Google search results. And then last but not least, we have used SMS as a tool. Uh, we have sent out joint SMS to entire population in Norway a few times during the pandemic. And on uh, March 12th, the first one went out. We have also sent SMS to Norwegians abroad. Uh, we notified all Norwegian mobile phone users who were in countries where entry in Norway would be tightened or lead to changes in quarantine. So this has, this has been messages that has been sent out several times a month to different uh, countries. We have used SMS to, to incoming mobile phone users. And uh, we have sent out SMS to all foreign mobile users that arrive in Norway. I will come back to that. And we have sent SMS to Russian seasonal workers, uh, especially during the winter time where we have a lot of uh, fishermen uh, working here in Norway. Uh, and we also have sent uh, SMS to foreign workers uh, from Poland and Lithuania on their own language. Uh, the tool we use looks like this. And uh, first we have to select the country where the mobile users are present. And here I have choose Latvia. Uh, and the system calculates that there are 399 uh, Norwegians in Latvia at the moment. Then we type in the message we want to send out in this uh, screen. And then the system uh, sends the message out and we have uh, received with uh, the total number of estimated subscribers. Uh, and the total number of delivered messages and failed messages to this country. Uh, as I told you before, we have sent out SMS to all foreign mobile users that arrive in Norway throughout the pandemic. And the content of an SMS has been adjusted according to changing rules and conditions here in Norway. Uh, we estimate that the total number of messages has been around 2 million. And we have used a specially designed solution for a vendor to achieve this. And here you can see some examples of the messages in different languages and an overview of the, um, the uh, highest number of people in, uh, in different countries that have um, uh, arrived in Norway. So what have we learned? Um, we had some reactions. Some people have complained that they felt monitored after receiving an SMS related to their whereabouts. Uh, that might be understandable. But we do not receive any information about the mobile users. We tell the system which type of mobile subscribers we want to address. We create a text message and get the number of recipients in return. We don't see any mobile numbers or other personal information 
during each uh, mobile user. And that's important. We believe a combination of public warning messages and targeted information via social media is a good way to keep the public informed. And uh, we believe that this had the greatest impact in the first days, this SMS uh, messages. The fact that everyone received an SMS from the authorities for the first time ever probably helped to emphasize the seriousness of the situation. So did it help? Service shows that the population in Norway had great confidence in the health authorities' information and handling of the pandemic. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have studies that show the effect on the individual information channels. But the dialogue with the population and the tools I have talked about in this presentation have probably contributed to the numbers shown here being as high as they are. So this was my last slide. Thank you for listening in and have a great conference. Thank you, Sven. Uh, very good presentation. Um, questions, anyone? Uh, please, the one at the back. Who is really my colleague, Jerome, this time? Ah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Jerome from INA, indeed. Um, I'm also living in Belgium, so uh, I know a bit how it happened, uh, this communication. Um, Yves, can you tell, tell us a bit more about how you have used yourself a public warning system in Belgium to communicate toward the population? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so we have a public warning system called uh, B-Alert. Uh, B-Alert is a system, uh, a multiple channel uh, platform, so we can use Sorry. Uh, so we can use different uh, channels uh, to uh, alert the population. First of all, we have the SMS. We have also uh, vocal messages uh, on uh, cell phones, but also on fixed phones. And we have an option um, to send emails. Uh, and during uh, the crisis, uh, we have uh, used the option to send emails with the latest restrictions. So every time when there was uh, um, a decision to uh, adapt to the restrictions, we sent an email to all um, the, the citizens who were uh, who registered, who are, who are registered in the system. So in Belgium, we have the option to send a message to everyone who's registered in the system, or we can send an SMS uh, to everyone who is at that moment in the selected area. But for the pandemic, uh, we took the option to send an email to everyone who was registered uh, in uh, the system. And for this moment, there are almost one million uh, people registered in the system, what is about 10% uh, of the total uh, population. If that's uh, Thank you. answer to your question. Thank you, Eva. Actually, I must make a comment on this because mm. I have a personal story with this. So at the time, um, more or less at the same time, France had for the first time uh, actually used some kind of public warning. Um, so basically a message was sent to all the French mobile phone numbers uh, in the country and abroad. Baptiste at the back, maybe you remember this. And um, and uh, and I was quite surprised. The reaction on social media were like, wow, Big Brother is here. They have our numbers. Of course, because French government had never communicated about having a public warning system and above all had never efficiently used the public warning system during the unfortunate, uh, terrible terrorist attacks previous to that. And uh, and so I remember then I called, I talked to your colleague, previous colleague, uh, Benoit Ramaker yeah. at the time, and I said, Benoit, why didn't you use a public warning? Did, why didn't I get an SMS? And I thought I was in the right in a way to ask for an SMS, and then he literally explained, people know about the topic. Yeah. They already seen it on TV, on radio, everywhere. They all know about the measures. So sending a message would only scare them further, and they are already scared, and which today I really understand with your presentations. Yeah, uh, for this moment, we are doing right now uh, a very uh, large-scale test with the system. 
So I uh, also <laughs> looking <laughs> to my cell phone <laughs> to see the reactions on social media. But we have communicated uh, in advance uh, about this test. But today we will send uh, more than one million uh, test messages uh, to all the people who are this moment in the province of Antwerp. Uh, so it's the first time that's a test on such a scale. Uh, this we, we will see the reaction on social media, but the reaction of Big Brother is always there. There, so, but we are uh, we have prepared some standard uh, answers. But I hope my colleagues are dealing it well. But good luck. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Anyone? To Eve or yeah, please. We're a bit late. We were aware of it, but the discussion is. Enjoyable. So, hi, uh, I'm Adam from St John Ambulance in, in England. Um, how do you balance the confliction between your public messages and politicians maybe saying something quite different and that battle? Uh, very, very good question. Uh, how many hours do we have? <laughs> no, it's um, for. Us, as a crisis center, as a governmental organization, it was from the, the, uh, from the beginning, our objective was very clear. We want to be a trustful, a credible partner during this uncertain period. And for us, that was the main objective. It was also projected on a whiteboard um, with correct and objective information. And in the perfect world, um, your information and, inform and the political information is the same voice, the same message, the same um, empathy. But we notice in beginning that was the there was uh, the, the in our communication, the communication of the political level was the same, the same um, empathy, a lot of solidarity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But further in a crisis you have the political game. And some uh, political parties want to um, have other obje objectives. But it's important, I think, for a, a, a governmental organization to stay on your line. We are a credible and a trustful partner. And we don't play games. Our objective is to inform um, all the citizens with correct and objective information. And we stay on that line. And at the end, um, there are a lot of uh, surveys. And, and one of the most trustful uh, spokespersons during this crisis was the doctor, because he explained almost every day the situation. Um, without uh, playing a game of without other objectives. The only objective is I want to explain the situation in plain language for all the citizens. And if you stay on that line, you will be seen as a trustful partner, and maybe more than the, than, than the minister or the prime minister. But it's very challenging. Um, but also a uh, close contact or good contact with the spokespersons of the, the ministers can help. And sometimes, sometimes they listen to you and they take into account our advice, but sometimes they play another game. Very interesting. I must make a, just a comment on this also, um, and maybe if you can jump in, but um, so. For instance, if you compare even the UK versus Belgium or France versus Belgium, one has to understand that Belgium has a very complicated <laughs> political and decision-making structure. Uh. And complicating, we're being polite. Sometimes it's hilarious, and we don't even know. For instance, when we had to reopen the office with Jerome, we spent so much time trying to look for whether or not we had to wear a mask, mm. etc. What were the rules? And we barely. Did by d digging and digging, could find anything that would apply to the region of Brussels versus the rest. So I must say it's a miracle to be able to communicate properly, uh, constantly yeah. in Belgium. But I wanted to ask you, how, how did you manage that? These sometimes hilarious political decisions, the variations of decisions between Flanders, Wallonia, and Brussels? Uh, 
I'm a long distance uh, runner, so that can help <laughs> <laughs> sometimes just to to relax. Um, yeah, sometimes it's, it's very difficult to explain. Uh, for example, the sometimes hilarious uh, restrictions. Uh, and as a spokesperson, sometimes, and that's the most difficult if you are not agree or, or, of, or you can't explain the why of the restrictions. And that's so important. Why are there, uh, why, are there, uh, why, it's why is, it, is it necessary to take this restriction? If you can explain that, that's okay. But if there is no rational reason to take this restriction, it's hard and very frustrating to be a spokesperson. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We all thought of you when you had to communicate on the fact that people could go on the train to the sea, but had to sit only on one window. seat to the <laughs> close to the window, I think. Close the window. It was really a real measure, and it was like we just imagined <laughs> the nightmare of communicating that measures to the yeah. public <laughs> and making sense of it. Um, other question? If if I um, know I'm standing between you and lunch, uh, feel free to go for lunch. I'm not going to keep you. Just one last question for me to to Eve. Uh, 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 you said you work with influencers, so so yep. are you able sometimes to disclose the name, or is it is it Private information? Uh, no, we can say the names, but uh, I don't know all. You don't know, yeah. No, no. no I was just wondering. Uh, that's sorry, very Belgian story, but there are two two hilarious humorists in Belgium, French speaking, uh, Pablo Andres and Guillaume. Did you work with them? I, I must say, as a recipient, and I'm guessing you worked with them. Maybe you simply don't know, but these were very powerful. I think for as a recipient, these very very famous humorists. Uh, sorry, you don't know them abroad, of course, but. But they were very efficient in the communication, making us laugh about how oh, we cannot go out, but we can do kayak. Yeah. But still making us realize, uh, you know, the scope of this pandemic, and I think communicating to the young public, the use of these influencers probably had a huge impact. I believe so. I wanted to congratulate you for this. All right, I've, we're speaking too much. If uh, no, no. <laughs> will be available for lunch uh, in case you have questions to ask him. So now the formal things. Um, uh, we're inviting you to the lunch break in Hall 1 and 2, lunch powered by our platinum sponsors. I'd like to thank them, Beta AT and Huawei. Um, we invite everyone back at 2 p.m. Uh, sharp, please. Uh, track one session here, how to improve accessibility for people uh, with disabilities in the same in this room. Track two, cooperation with volunteers to tackle emergencies in room alpha and industry session in track three in room beta. Thank you all very much.